Hi everyone. We are going over the learning chapter for um, the module and the weekly lesson. And um, I'm just going to briefly highlight what learning is. Learning is a semi-permanent change in behavior. So it's not always, um, it, it, you can learn and then you can unlearn that there, that much is true. But so it's semi-permanent change in behavior. And um, one of the concepts that is applied here for those of you who have the learn, uh, behaviorist perspective, the behaviorism, if you remember back when we were studying our original theories, um, behaviorism is anything behavior that's been learned, whether it be by reinforcement, um, however it's learned, it's uh, still, it's a taught behavior. Uh, so it goes over the tenets of behaviorism in the module. Um, another is, and the most um, talked about and discussed thing in this uh, weekly lesson is associative learning. Associative learning is classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Um, there is an association between two stimuli and you predict um, what will happen if these two stimuli are put together. Um, operant learning, how is it different? Operant learning um, has to do with behavior. Classical conditioning, not really having to do with behavior. It has to do with the two stimuli and the association. If A presents itself, then B, this will occur. Operant condition takes it a step further and it includes behavior. If A presents itself, then B will elicit this behavior. Um, so just kind of that's um, an easy uh, uh, definition there. It may get a little confusing because it talks about the unconditioned stimulus. Um, what a neutral stimulus is, is that means, um, let's use Pavlov's dogs, that example that is discussed in the book. When the bell initially rings, the dogs had no idea why the bell was ringing and they didn't care why it was ringing. They were just like, there's a loud sound. But when they noticed that over a period of three, four, five, six times, every time that bell rang, they happened to present meat powder. And therefore, where it used to mean nothing, the bell meant nothing, which was a neutral stimulus, it is now um, a conditioned stimulus. Now, every time the bell rings, they realize that the meat powder is going to follow it, associative learning. So now it is. it went from being a neutral stimulus to being a conditioned stimulus. The ringing of the bells conditioned stimulus. And guess what? Originally, the bell rang. And yeah, when they smelled meat powder, they salivated and got hungry. So that was an unconditioned response. But it was like a one in a whatever situation lo um, happening. They didn't realize it was going to be repetitive. So now the ringing of the bell elicits them salivating. So it went from a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. And now every time that bell rings and they salivate, they have um, a conditioned response because they know they're about to get fed. The meat powder is going to be sprinkled on their food. So um, it's really not that difficult if you think about what the terms mean. Condition means obviously there's something that they've been trained on. Uh, so that's classical conditioning. Now, another type of associative learning that is discussed is observational learning. And this is when you um, watch someone play a game. You've never played the game. And then immediately when you go in to play the game, you do exactly what the others have done and you've picked up um, the behavior. You know exactly how to do it. We do this every day, um, whether it be putting our lipstick on the right way, watching mom do it, or whether it is... Um, like I said, playing some game, or here's a better one. We have found that parents who smoke, the kids have never picked up a cigarette, but the first they learn that it's okay to smoke because parents are smoking. The very first time they smoke, they don't have to like teach themselves, light it, hold your breath in, hold it with your fingers. They have observed their parents doing it for so long that they do it right the first time. The behavior is correct the first time. So that's observational learning. Um, it's when you observe and you imitate someone else. Uh, let's see. Uh, you want to familiarize yourself with generalization and discrimination. Generalization is when you have, you may have a higher bell ring in the terms of Pavlov's dogs versus a lower sounding ring, but no matter what, you still get 
the meat powder. And so that means that um, it's just a bell ringing. It's a generalized bell. It doesn't matter. But let's say that stops. And let's say that only high pitched bells that ring give you meat powder. So then you're going to have to discriminate. Wait, hold up. Is that a low pitch or is that a high pitch bell? Because we're not going to get fed the meat powder if it's, you know, a low pitch. You've learned to recognize that it has to be a specific pitch of a bell. That's the difference between generalization and discrimination. Now, extinction is when the condition response, suddenly you're not being given um, the initial stimulus. It's no longer, you know, you, the bell rings, but they're no longer serving um, the meat powder. So the behavior that you're salivating stops because you're not getting, um, it, it's, there's no longer any association. It's not followed by anything. But spontaneous recovery is when immediately it picks back up after two weeks and it only takes three, four days before you start, you know, they're given the meat powder and immediately your behavior starts salivating again. You pick right up where you left off. Um, and just a side note, counter conditioning is what us therapists use to try to break a behavior. Um, is let's say that you're neurotic and you can't stop thinking about um your ex-boyfriend who did you wrong, you're trying to get past the ex, and you say, oh, but this, you know, every time I get in my car, he gave me my car, so I think about him, or every time this song comes on the radio or whatever. So what therapists will do is counter condition, and we make a list of these primary things every day that you feel are associated with the boyfriend. Let's say it's a song. And so what we do is we kind of counter condition. We give you another thought that we want you to think about when you hear that song um, or when you pass by your favorite restaurant. we And so it's called counter conditioning. Um, for addiction, especially for alcohol use, we do this as well. Um, that's called aversive conditioning. And we want every time you think about taking a sip of alcohol um, to have an aversion to it. And so what they do oftentimes if you go into treatment is give you antabuse. And this is a drug that literally makes you nauseated and makes you throw up so that they're trying in the brain to condition um, you to think every time you want to take a drink, you're thinking about throwing up in the hospital or, or how you're throwing up. Okay, I want you to read up on what it says about classical conditioning and how our brain can control our body's immune system. That's really interesting. They used to not put stuff like this in the textbook. I love that they are because the brain often controls what goes on with the body. So if you have a mantra or if you can train your brain to, you have to put the time in 10 minutes a day or whatever and focus, you know, imagine that your um, brain is producing positive bacteria and it's fighting the negative bacteria, the brain eventually will start to do what you are thinking to tell it to do. And that's what they're talking about with um, immunosuppression, um, placebo pills. Uh, it's really come a long ways because a lot of the medical field was like, oh, no, we don't believe that. It is true. And they're starting to research it and put it into the text. So that's um, a long time coming. Taste aversion only takes is one particular type of learning. It takes one time for you to get food poison, throw up, sick for days on end. And you know what? You never eat it again. Miss Harris is a, I've been a vegetarian for 30 years, I think, a very long time. Um, it started out with food poison and that's where I ended my relationship with that food. And then I got food poisoned again. And then um, it just, it has a lot to do with taste aversion. Um, it only takes one time though. Let's see, um, advertisers use conditioning all the time. Um, beer commercials are notorious. What do you see in beer? Sometimes I'm trying to figure out what the, what they're even selling because there's so many pretty girls or handsome guys um, in the background. And so what they're really selling is, hey, if you drink, I don't know, if you drink, make a love light, you know, you're going to be surrounded by pretty girls or hot guys. Um, it's that conditioning. Um, not true. It is subliminal marketing. It is not true, but that's what they use. Or a sunny beach. Um, you know, you'll be surrounded by a sunny beach. So, okay. So operant conditioning, just to go on that again, 
this is has to do with behavior change. We too, we it's an associative learning um, technique, but there's two as association between stimuli one, stimuli two, but then there's also a um, behavior change. And how does how are there behavior changes? Well, reinforcement, reinforcement. A reinforcement can be positive or it can be negative. Um, it uh, it doesn't matter because negative means you remove something. Positive means you add. It does not mean good or bad. You're just saying that you are um, adding something, trying to alter the behavior. So, of course, um, kindergarten, you if you do not stand in a straight line, you pull a card, which is a negative, and that means that you you know, don't get the opportunity to get a prize at the end of the week or something. But if you, um, so that's negative reinforcement. Um, positive reinforcement is um, if you get a card added, then you get an extra prize. So you're adding, taking away. Now, another is shaping. And shaping is when every little, you know, we give, we build up, we give you a little reward here, a little reward there. For if you do this, we'll give you this. If you do that, we'll give you that. So, it's incremental and you're trying to shape to um, the behavior that you want. Uh, so just, you know, we went over, you know, uh, positive and negative reinforcement. Primary reinforcers are survival, food, things that we need, that we have to have food. Secondary are things, reinforcers like money, um, a new car, something like that. However, when we take our pets out and we have them go potty, um, or, you know, we're training them and we give them little treats. That can be primary because it's food, but it can also be secondary. So just to let you know that, you know, that can be, that can be described as both. But primary generally deals with um, things we need to survive, like food, water, um, shelter. And then secondary is um, exactly what it is, like money or um, something that we don't necessarily need, but we give. So um, the chapter also talks about if you really want to change behavior um, or alter behavior, timing and reinforcement, there's different types um, and ways to do that, like shaping, you give a little bit every time. Delayed reinforcement, oops, delayed reinforcement is um, difficult for young children. I know you all may be familiar with the marshmallow um, experiment. It kills those little three and four year olds to not eat a marshmallow because they're told if you don't eat the marshmallow for like a period of 10 minutes, then you get two marshmallows. And that's just a lot of temptation for them sitting in front of them. So delayed reinforcement um, is better for older, uh, more adolescents. Uh, has, you know, to do with that, but um, make sure you read about the timing um, and the factors that go into different types of reinforcements when you actually um, get do the reinforcement. Okay, and observational learning, we talked about this imitation or modeling um, of behavior. Um, look at the cognitive factors that go into learning because there's quite quite a bit. I'm talking about like latent learning and being purposeful in what your learning is. All of this um, contributes to what we're learning um, and how we're learning. And then um, the cultural influences, it talks about um, classical conditioning, you know, what kind of culture you're in. Um, is it uh, promoted to learn. Sometimes it's not, you know, there are many cultures where especially women are not expected to learn. And also with learned helplessness, you know, people that exhibit a learned helplessness, you know, it's like, no matter what I do, you know, the negative, it's just going to be negative. It's just going to happen. And so therefore they don't learn. They have an issue with learning. And that is a psychological aspect issue that does take place. And it, it's not uncommon, especially for depressed people. Um, let's see. So that's the learning chapter. Um, probably you're going to hurdle the most with learning what a neutral, how is a neutral stimulus different from an unconditioned um, stimulus, from a conditioned stimulus. 
think about the terminology and it will just kind of be common sense. Don't get caught up in the initials. Just look at the words. Condition means I've learned something. Unconditioned means I haven't been trained, you know, with some with any type of association. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this chapter and focus on how can learning some of the key points, how can it assist you with your own learning, with retainment of material as you are um, reading through each chapter and trying to um, remember the concepts.